Okay, it's 11 o'clock. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to say welcome. My name is Susan Pridmore. I work for Students for Service in the Registrar's Office and um, the events team at the college. And uh, today you are joining our first ever online AC summer market. And so what we've done is, you know, we recognize because of the pandemic, uh, we're not able to have our events on campus. Um, and it, it is hard, you know, not to be there, not to be seeing everyone's faces. Um, and we started some new initiatives to have online events. And um, I love seeing the familiar faces. I'm encouraging everyone to turn their cameras on. Um, I've seen you in um, our AC Always Connected events, and it's great to see you here today. Um, and essentially the AC Summer Market um, is to help, you know, um, bring our students and staff together. We normally have the summer carnival. We normally have the barbecue in the summertime. And so this is really a way um, to take those events um, and get everybody connected um, and feeling good about the summer, even though there's a pandemic. Um, and so again, my name is uh, Susan. I'm going to be the host today, and I'm super happy uh, to welcome Emma. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. And that's just to remind everyone of uh, Zoom etiquette. If you can have yourselves on mute, uh, just while Emma is going through her talk and um, teaching us about um, you know, how not to kill things, which is what I do all the time. And, um, and then we'll do, um, I'll do a little bit of an introduction. We're going to do our, our normal question that we do to get everybody going. Um, and then the presentation um, will take place by Emma. The whole thing is going to be about 45 minutes. And then I'm hoping that you have all signed on for our other events that are happening throughout the day for this AC summer market, because it is going to be a great day. And again, um, we're just really all about um, bringing everyone together, supporting our local businesses, um, and, and really embracing uh, the positivity and, and looking at the good and what we can be doing just dur during this pandemic um, in Ottawa and getting you all ready for the summertime. So um, for those of you who have been on our online events before, we love kicking it off uh, with a question. And uh, what I will ask is that uh, everybody go into their chat. I'm going to ask the question, but you won't press enter until I, until I say go. Um, and the idea is just to get us all engaged and get us ready for the talk today. Um, and just a nice icebreaker beginning. I'm just gonna admit some more people here that are waiting in the waiting room. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you that were, um, Emma has been with us before and um, she was part of our AC Always Connected and um, she was absolutely fantastic. We had very, very good feedback. Um, and I laughed because um, my question for her um, during the event was, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a plant person um, and how do you not kill things? And I just really wanted to take a moment to let everybody know that now for the first time I went to my mother's house, I took a clipping and I have this clipping in my house and it has not died. I've had it here for a while. So I'm super pumped about that. So um, we sort of had, you know, that initial plants 101 and that was really fantastic and now this is a continuation of that talk um, and um, and what I'm super pumped about is she's going to talk about herbs um, as well as plants but the question I want to ask today is what is everyone's favorite summer herb um, so I will ask everyone to go into the chat and you can type your favorite summer herb and then on the count of three, I'm going to ask everyone to press enter and then we will all see our answers at the same time. Okay, so favorite summer herb, one, two, three, press enter. Oh, I love it. I put dill, there's a lot of dill, basil, thyme, amazing. Oh, grass, that's such a good one. Mint, cilantro, yep. Fantastic. I don't have to pay. That's okay too. <laughs> so hard to pick a favorite. I know, but it just gets me excited because it really does make me start to think about summer and barbecuing and uh, making like fresh salads and, and using those fresh herbs, which is really great. And so I will transition here to, um, I already mentioned Emma has been a part of our events already. Uh, she's the urban botanist um, and really just has a fantastic uh, business here in Ottawa. And uh, I'm gonna post her link so that you guys can get a hold of her if you need to. But again, the AC Summer Market is really all about, we, you know, we're recognizing that businesses need to be supported. Um, and so we wanted to do that today. So make sure to check out her website. She is um, a ton of energy 
Um, again, we had such good feedback the last time we had her, so we're really excited to have her here today. Um, so Emma, I will stop talking and pass it over to you, um, and we will let you teach us. Amazing. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so excited to be here, especially with all your smiling faces that I can see. So thank you all for joining me today. As Susan mentioned, my name is Emma. I'm from The Urban Botanist, which is a small local company that I started uh, fresh out of university about four years ago um, with the intent and purpose of encouraging people to engage with nature in an urban setting. I find that nowadays a lot of people feel starved for that interaction with nature and you might be going through your day-to-day -day feeling stressed, having trouble sleeping, maybe having a lot of anxiety, not feeling so much productivity or creativity coming through in your day-to-day -day actions. And I am such a strong believer in that introducing nature, even on a small scale like gardening with herbs, is a great way to freshen up those feelings that are kind of just lost. You know, you maybe have some brain fog, um, migraines on a daily basis. I really think that it can be as simple as, you know, mindful horticulture and engaging with nature inside our urban dwellings. It can be tough though, and I, I totally recognize that. And I think I definitely went through that phase at one point in my life where, you know, technology nowadays is designed to just constantly pull our attention and our brains are actually not wired to to manage that amount of constant constant um you, you know attention pulling so i find that you know even putting aside 10 to 20 minutes a day to interact with your plants at home or go outside maybe it's not so easy if you're living downtown to find a park or something nearby i'm lucky i'm kind of in the green belt area but it really can be as simple as just starting a little herb garden at home. So that's what I hope to talk to you guys about today, what herbs are, how to get started with them at home, and um, some of my top picks and you know how to go about using them. So that's what you can expect from today's um, session. Um, so let's just get right into it. What are herbs? Uh, that question has kind of been rolling in, you know, what's a herb? What's the difference between a herb and a house plant? Um, and not all that much in that herbs are, of course, plants. They're typically a very flavorful or fragrant plant. Um, they don't tend to develop woody or, um, you know, bark elements to them. So they're, they're more soft, aerial um, parts of the plant. Um, you know, the exception to that is maybe rosemary. Rosemary can get a little bit woody, but it's not considered to be true bark. So those are what herbs are, you know, in a short form. And I actually find that herbs are a lot easier to care for than house plants. And they also require a lot less space. So if you're looking to kind of engage with horticulture in your homes, I think that starting a herb garden is a really great way to um, get started. Um, so, as I said, you know, they're typically quite fragrant, they're aromatic. Um, not only do herbs have numerous uh, healing and powerful um, benefits, but they're also really rich in nutrients and can help keep illnesses at bay while promoting healthy glow and um, good health. They're used for flavorings and cookings, they're used for fragrances, and they're used in teas. So we're going to talk a little bit all about all of those things. Um, one thing that I find so interesting about plants and, and their healing properties is just how many different plants have been used and, and synthesized for creating modern medicines, such as morphine from poppies, aspirin from white willow bark. So, you know, there are some extremes to what plants can do for us. And I find that even by in integrating the simple ones that you can get at your grocery stores or at your local nurseries can really introduce a lot of those health benefits. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of my favorite herbs. Um, does anybody here love tea or are you a tea drinkers? You can wave, you can just think to yourself, yeah, I'm a tea drinker, I love teas. 
Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about some of the tea, some of the herbs that are really good to have um, when it when it comes to making teas. Um, so some things to start off with are is ginger root, which is a root section of a plant. Um, things like calendula, chamomile, echinacea, peppermint, sage are some really good herbs to start off maybe your tea um, collection. And when it comes to making teas, of course, a lot of these herbs are dried. And I've also been asked, you know, how do you go about drying your herbs? How does it work? What's the best method for actually drying out um, your herbs at home? So one thing that I would start off with is saying, what time of day should I be harvesting my herbs, my fresh herbs that are growing in my garden outside or inside? And the best time of day to harvest your herbs or snip your herbs is actually going to be on a dry day. You know, maybe not on a day when it's rained or the day after when there's maybe a little bit more humidity and moisture in the air. And that's because too much moisture can cause your herbs to spoil or mold. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, another thing also is to to, to try and um, harvest them in the morning. And the reason for that being is the sun coming out can actually cause a lot of the really fragrant and flavorful elements of your herbs to actually evaporate away. So you wanna try doing this in the morning to try and preserve as much of those flavorful and tasty elements of those herbs as possible. Now, how to dry them out. Let's start with that too. When it comes to actually drying out your herbs, there's so many ways that you can go about doing this. It can be as simple as laying them flat down on a piece of paper towel, just, to, um, just so that that paper towel can absorb any excess moisture. Another great way is just to use a piece of string. You can tie the tops. I typically like to put these inside of a paper bag to also dry. I find that by doing that, you're protecting the herbs from insects. You're also um, keeping the, you know, any debris from kind of falling down onto the floor. And also again, really maintaining that, that smell, that fragrancy, and uh, that flavor that, you know, we really want to preserve when it comes to herbs. So that's something that I would recommend. Um, so I'll also talk a little bit about care for your herbs. I'm going to jump around a little bit from care to what herbs are my favorite. And uh, by the end of it, we'll cover everything that I hope to cover for our workshop. So this is sage. This is one of my favorite ones. How many people at home are a little bit witchy, know anything about smudging or what a smudge stick is? How many people have no idea at all? Couple people have no idea at all what a smudge stick is. This goes back to, you know, ancestral times where um, actual smudge sticks have been used in, you know, spiritual ceremonies, uh, healing practices. I'm actually a huge smudger, um, but there's a lot of um, essentially spiritual and medicinal benefits associated with sage. And one thing that I think would be really cool, and I'm actually going to do this myself, is creating my own smudge stick. And how these work is essentially you light your stick. It, of course, releases a beautiful scent. And what you want to do is something like this. And what I think is such a beautiful concept of herbs and plants in general is using the power within this particular herb to remove negative entities, to um, help remove any negative or toxic feelings or, or emotions or, you know, um, energies within yourself, within your space. So by lighting something like this, which is essentially all dried sage and just working it around yourself, working it around your room. I personally work it around my plants, um, especially, you know, during the winter when your plants can kind of go into their dormancy stage and just get a little bit sad. Um, I find that, you know, kind of doing a little smudge to kind of introduce some nice positive flow 
um, this really is a thing, believe it or not, and I, I'm really into it, is kind of just a nice way to, again, engage with nature and kind of connect with yourself and um, your inner consciousness. So that's kind of a cool thing that I love about this herb, particularly sage. Most herbs do require full sun. So if you're gardening outside or you're, you know, you've got a little ledge inside of your apartment or condo, um, you do want to make sure that you're finding a space that has a lot of full sun. Um, and that's, that's more or less um, for, for just about all herbs. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb is you want to make sure that your herbs are getting a lot of full sun. Now, for those of you who are beginners at home and you're not sure where to start, should I start with seeds, little seedlings? Should I start with, you know, small plants from a nursery? I like to recommend, you know, of course, trying a little bit of both. But if you're a beginner and, you know, you really want to start growing your green thumb and growing your, your herb garden, I would actually suggest going with, you know, a small to medium starter plant. This rosemary here, for example, to start this from seed, I, I bought this at a, at a grocery store. Most grocery stores have these, a lot of your local nurseries, Richmond Nursery, Richie's out in the East End, um, Make It Green Garden Center, will carry a nice, beautiful variety of herbs. And the thing that I like to suggest about why to start with, you know, smaller plants as opposed to seed, is it really helps to, um, give you that confidence. Um, starting from seed can of course take a long time. If all of the metrics aren't perfect, they might not grow to their biggest full and beautiful fragrant selves. So I find starting with something that's been started and is a little bit you know, on its way to becoming a nice big full grown plant is a great way for beginners to, to start growing their herb gardens. They're very inexpensive, you know, they're less than $5 a herb. So a great inexpensive way to get started on your herb gardens. Now I'm sure a lot of you are aware of uh, perennials versus annuals. And if you're not, um, I'll explain what a perennial or and an annual is and what the difference between those two are. I personally am a huge um, perennial purchaser. And the reason for that being is any perennial plant is going to continue to come back year after year. You're not going to have to repurchase the same plants and plant them year after year. So it's kind of a great way to ensure that your garden is going to come back without having to again go through and spend the same amount of money year after year. So that applies to herbs as well. There are perennial and there are annual herbs. Luckily, I find most of my favorite herbs are perennials. So rosemaries are perennials. Thyme is perennials. Mint is a perennial. So these are herbs that I plant each year and each year again following, they start to come back, which is really great. Um, now I saw in the chat that most people's favorite herb is basil. And that's actually probably my favorite herb too. There's just something about basil. It's great in a sweet cocktail or a lemonade. It's obviously amazing on pizza. Dill is also delicious. You cannot go wrong with dill. I find that growing dill from seed, mind you, is, um, is pretty tricky. So I've been actually buying my dill again in a small plant form. Um, but basil is actually an annual. So that's one of the, our favorites, right? Um, and because it's an annual, it's a herb that you have to keep buying each year. It has a cycle where after it flowers, it will essentially die and you'll have to um, replant it. But that's okay. That's just the cycle that they go through. I will talk a little bit more about basil because it is such a fan favorite. It's one of my favorites. They can get really, really big, bushy, beautiful. They can also get quite spindly. Who has a basil plant at home that's kind of growing a little bit spindly? A few people? Okay. I'm going to show you guys how to actually um, harvest your basil because it's actually a really important method to ensure that your basil is actually growing big, bushy, full, as opposed to kind of getting scraggly and reaching. Now, when you, are, when you go to your basil plant, a lot of 
people's natural go-to method for pruning a basil plant is to just pluck off the leaves kind of one by one. It's like, oh, I only want a couple leaves for my pizza, a couple leaves for my pasta. So I'll just pluck a couple of leaves off. When in fact, this is not the right method for pruning basil. What you're going to want to actually do is consider this as the top of one of your stems. You want to actually cut off the stem in top, not entirely, but you know, you want to leave at least a good four inches below it. So you want to actually cut off a top of the basil. And the reason for that being is that it will force the plant to start pushing out more leaves and more leaves, as opposed to just plucking off these individual leaves from the petiole. When you actually um, cut the stem, it will force the plant to grow more and more leaves and making it nice and full and bushy. Another thing to take into consideration with basil is when it flowers. Can you guys see that okay? The flowers coming in on the basil. You kind of want to prevent the flowers from coming in. So if you're noticing your basil is just about to start putting out blooms, the best thing for you to do is to actually cut those off. The reason for that is when the flowers actually come in on your basil, I find it actually changes the overall flavor of the basil itself. It kind of changes it from being its nice, um, you know, sweet almost flavor to having a little bit more of um, a bitterness to it. So I find that by keeping all the flowers kind of controlled and, and so, sort of severing them as they come through is a great way to, again, encourage more growth with your basil and to um, maintain its nice, delicious, sweet, fresh flavor. That's a little bit about basil. Ooh, I'm going to move on to, oh, I just love these. It smells amazing in here. Honestly, I wish that I could just share this smell through the screen because I've got the thyme, I've got the mint, I've got the basil. It's so beautiful smelling. Oh my gosh, I love it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about these guys here. How gorgeous are these flowers coming in? This is green onion and um, it's in the garlic family, Aleums. And I, what I love about these flowers and what not a lot of people realize is that these are actually incredibly fragrant and incredibly flavorful. So you can pull these flowers off, you can put them in a vinegar, you can um, infuse a beautiful vinegar, make a balsamic vinaigrette um, with these nice, fresh, gorgeous flowers. Um, or you know what, they just look kind of pretty too. They smell amazing, amazing, amazing. What shall we talk about next? Oh, let's talk about how to actually get the most out of the flavors inside of your herbs. You know, some people might just pick them and slice them into their pizzas, you know, or into your pasta or into your cocktail mix. Um, maybe even mint, especially that's a popular for mojitos or, you know, a fresh lemonade. Um, I absolutely love mint. And like I mentioned, it is a perennial. So it does come back year after year. How do you grow the green onion? Um, you can buy green onion, of course, started, or you can start it from seed. These were actually started from seed. They're really easy to grow. Um, if you were to even buy green onion at um, your grocery store, a lot of them have roots on them. You can put those right into water and the roots will continue to grow. And then you can transplant them out into your garden, which is really cool. And I've had a lot of success with that personally. Um, but let's talk about how to actually activate the fragrance and the flavors inside of your herbs. So how many of you have heard about slapping mint? or abrasing your mint. Some people, a couple people, that's actually one of the best ways to get the flavor and to get that fragrancy out of your mint. Some people might actually, you know, grind it with a mortar and pestle. I'm gonna show you guys how to do that too. But with something like mint, it's actually as simple as, and it's also the most effective way to get that flavor and smell out of your mint. So just a couple slaps between the hands is one of the best ways to activate that smell and scent. 
And I love just putting a little bit of mint in with some ice water and lemon. Oh, I'm gonna have a sip. It's just, you smell it as you're drinking it, you taste it as it's mm, coming into your, mm. That's a really great way for actually getting the most out of your mint. Now, how many people have or have heard of a mortar and pestle? These are absolutely incredible and necessary when it comes to getting the most out of your herbs, creating pestos, really grinding up and releasing those, that, those fragrant and aromatic properties that are what you want to get out of your herbs, right? So let's talk about this thyme here for a minute. I love thyme. For anyone who loves mushrooms, um, I find that thyme and just if, if you if you love eating meat, I don't eat a lot of meat. I don't really eat any at all. But I find that in, incorporating thyme in with mushrooms or in with your pasta sauces really helps to kind of bring in that savory, full uh, taste that kind of comes with um, eating, you know, any sort of meat product, red meat specifically. Um, so if you're more ve vegan vegetarian like me, I really like cooking with thyme because it helps to introduce that sort of um, savory taste to your, um, to your food. Now, when it comes to actually harvesting thyme, some, some herbs you can, you can harvest the whole stem. Uh, lavender, for example, the whole stem can be used if you're, if you're making soaps or if you're infusing lemonades. Um, but when it comes to thyme, you're not really going to use the stem. And I find the best way to actually get all of the little tiny leaves off of your thyme is to take a stem and just slowly pull up from the base, pull the stem away, just to give you the little tiny leaves that you're looking for. Throw those into your mortar and pestle you don't want it growing too, too hard, but really just by doing, just by doing this action really releases those flavors and the smell. And the good thing about a stone mortar and pestle is that the actual stone isn't going to be absorbing or taking away any of those um, important fragrance or flavors. So that's why I love using a proper stone um, mortar and pestle. And um, this is a great method for um, also making pesto at home. Um, I find that if you're using, you know, a, um, a food blender, that it can actually over blend your pest, your, your basil, or it can over blend some of your herbs. So some of the best ways is actually, you know, the more simple methods of mortar and pestle, or even just slapping like I showed you with the mint. Okay, now let's talk about actually planting your herbs if you were to start them from seed. I actually have a really great method that I like to use, particularly for small seeds. For those of you who um, want to start from seed or have started from seed and you're looking for a more effective and efficient way to actually plant your seeds at home, I am going to show you one of my methods that I like using. So I'm going to use Thai basil. I find that Thai basil has such a different flavor profile than a traditional uh, basil plant does. I love Thai basil. It also comes um, with such a gorgeous purple coloring too. Um, but the thing about Thai basil is its seeds are so, so tiny. You can see them there. I'll put them down just here. They're very, very tiny seeds. And with very small seeds, it can be hard to control where they're falling inside of your pot or where you're putting them exactly in your garden. So this is a method that I like to use, and it's very simple and easy for you to do at home. Um, you'll need your seeds, of course. You're going to need a pot with some high-grade potting soil. I use ProMix. You can use anything, really. Um, that's just going to be a good nutrient-rich potting soil. 
You want to make sure that that soil is a little bit moist. Just so that those seeds can make contact with a nice moist soil. You're also going to need a little piece of string. So the string is good for tying the top for hanging your for, for hanging your herbs or for this method that I'm about to show you, which is the string method. A little cup of water. Just want to soak that string inside your water. Wring it out just a little bit there. And then you just are going to sprinkle some of your seeds down onto a table. Make sure you guys can see that. Just like that. And then what you're going to do is take your damp string and just kind of curl it back and forth into your seeds. And the seeds will all very delicately attach to the string. Kind of see them getting on there. What you're going to do from there, so I just take my string, kind of curl it into a little circle, just like that. And then I gently press it down into the soil, making sure to cover the string just slightly with soil. You don't want to plant your seeds too deep. Kind of my rule of thumb is, you know, if your seed is about a millimeter thick, you only want to put about a millimeter of soil on top. If you're putting too much soil, that little seedling isn't going to be able to um, push through. So you really want to make sure that you're not covering too much soil over your fresh little seedlings. Just like that. I find this is a great way to have control over your, um, your tiny seeds. If you wanted them in rows, you could do that too. This method also works well um, using toilet paper. If you don't have string at home, you can lay out, you know, a sheet of toilet paper. It's kind of fitting for COVID. Um, but you know, a short, um, you know, couple squares of toilet paper, you can just moisten down the center place your seeds down the center, fold it in half, it's biodegradable of course, and then you can put that into your little planter box. Um, you can use one square and put that inside of your little pot. And that method actually works really well also. So those are some little tips for you there. Emma, there's one more question um, on this topic. Bob is just asking, do you harvest the seeds from your basil plant? That's a great question. Um, I have never, harvested seeds from my basil plant, but I have harvested seeds from other plants. Um, and that can be tricky uh, depending on how well versed you are in recognizing where the seeds are coming from, from the plants. And um, just making sure that uh, you're not damaging any other part of the plant when harvesting them. But absolutely, um, that's another great way of just, you know, saving your dollars instead of going out and buying seeds. You can just harvest them from your plants this year, save them for next year, keep them in a dry, uh, cool space because of course, warmth and humidity promotes germination. So, and germinating is essentially when the seed um, is activated and, and will, will start to grow. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping any seeds out of a, um, out of, you know, a warm, moist, humid space. So that's important for sure. Um, another thing that I always like to do is use a tag. These are reusable. Um, they're kind of like a little dry erase. Um, popsicle sticks work great too, but um, all seeds kind of look really similar. And especially once they get into here and you don't have them labeled, I like to almost straight away put a label on it so that you know when stuff starts coming up, popping up, you're not like, huh, I wonder what that was. I mean, it's always fun. And sometimes I've actually planted things and they've turned out to not be that at all. You know, it can be easy to kind of mix these guys up. 
uh, within their different packages, but um, I find that that's a really good method um, as well. Oh, parsley. Parsley lovers. I love fresh parsley. Now, so, something interesting about parsley is it's not a perennial and it's not an annual. It's actually considered a biennial, meaning that it only actually uh, blossoms or comes into full effect on its second year. So the first year, some people might be growing parsley at home, um, or you may have bought some from um, a local store, and it's not really giving you those big leafy bits that you're after. And that's because it won't really start producing that until its second year. So that's kind of something interesting about parsley and why you might be experiencing that at home. So I think we will go ahead and start the Q&A session um, because I'm sure there are lots of questions and I want to make sure that I'm able to answer as many as possible. Amazing. That is great timing. I was just going to say we have about 10 minutes left. So we're Perfect. getting some questions in the chat and I want to just, I'm going to actually stop spotlighting Emma. So we can see everybody's face. If you guys want to put on gallery view, you're more than welcome to, again, just to get some face-to-face -face time so we can see everybody. Um, so feel free, I'll read the questions that are in the chat um, and I'll try to pay attention if anyone's raising their hand. Um, but if, um, you know, the idea is that we're talking to each other and, and everyone's got a voice here. Um, so feel free if you want to ask a question live, I'm happy with that as well. Um, okay, so the first question from Juliana, how often should you water herbs? That's a good one. Um, that is a great question. Um, my kind of rule of thumb is I really never like to let my herbs completely dry out. Um, something like a rosemary has a little bit more of a thick succulent stem and leaf. So they might be able to go a little bit longer without watering. But the thing is, as I mentioned before, herbs like a lot of direct full sun. So keeping that in mind, you can imagine they're photosynthesizing a lot faster. They need a lot of energy. Their soil is drying out fast. So you probably want to water your herbs daily, if not every two days. Awesome. Thank you. Um, our next question from Bobby, how moist do you keep your plants over the winter? That is a great question, Bobby. Um, I would say that one of the number one causes of plant fatality is overwatering, especially during the winter. All of us have our plants at home and we're like, oh, I'm going to be the best plant mom, plant dad ever. I'm going to water my plants every single day. Not the case for the winter. I know that we shouldn't even be speaking that horrible W word right now because it's beautiful summertime, but you do want to keep that into consideration because your plants are going dormant in the winter. Also, our days are a lot shorter, um, so they're not photosynthesizing as often. They don't need as much water. Their soil's not drying out as quickly. Um, I kind of like to let my plants dry out a little bit in between waterings just to avoid overwatering, which is really easy to happen, um, especially during the winter. Okay, awesome. Okay, and I love this next one. And shoot, I've been scrolling through now, so I, oh, here it is. Um, I feel like everyone's talking about stevia. Um, so my daughter's stevia plant has black areas on it. Do you think that it's mold? Emma, are you familiar with stevia plants? Black areas or areas? Black areas. Okay. Um, if this plant, well, mind you, I was going to say, if this plant is growing outside or inside, um, anytime you're seeing black or dark brown patches, um, if it's kind of starting in the center of the plant leaf, um, not so much the edges, but in the center, those are kind of a red flag of either overwatering or potentially a uh, fungal bacteria infection. It also could be insects. I personally have just been hit hard with a thrips infestation, like literally I've been doing treatments all morning and you can kind of see it on this plant here, but just a little bit of discoloration on the leaves. Take a closer look. If you have a plant at home that's, um, you know, normally in good health and kind of all of a sudden the edges are kind of browning or yellowing um, and the leaves are just kind of getting some discoloration it might be time to either take a closer look, and I mean a very close look, thrips, for example, spider mites, mealybugs, all of the traditional indoor pests, 
they're also outdoor pests, um, are very, very tiny and hard to see. But I promise you, if you look close enough and you're noticing anything that just looks a little off, it's likely that you have or could have a um, pest problem. Um, but you know, dark areas could also be overwatering, and um, you yourself should know uh, if you are overwatering. It's like, oh well, I did water it three times today, so that's oh oh that's weird. Oh, that's why. Um, so maybe take that into consideration um, for oh for why this might be happening. Yes, yeah, send me a picture too. I'm on Instagram. Um, we are at the Urban Botanist all over Instagram. I love getting plant pictures in. Feel free to send me uh, yours if you're still unsure. Perfect. And I, I posted that in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more, but yeah, if you guys have um, further questions, um, um, check out Emma's Instagram page. And um, I know one of the colleagues I work with, um, she's always sending you pictures, which is super helpful. And I can imagine as we all get more plants, we'll have some more questions. Um, so Julian, I saw your hand was up. I know that your question's in the chat now, but I just wanted to give you opportunity if you just wanted to ask Emma live. Yeah, hi Emma, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I had a question, how much, like, can I leave my plant on like my kitchen counter away from the window or does it have to be really close to, to the window? Like uh, I was interested in rosemary particularly or basil. Okay, yeah, that's a great question, Julian. Thank you so much for asking. Um, you know, I did mention that herbs do love a lot of bright, direct sun. However, it's not necessary. Maybe a lot of spaces too, especially in urban downtown areas, not a lot of people are blessed to have a lot of direct sun, which is fine. Um, you know, bright indirect light is also okay. It doesn't need to be, you know, directly south facing right in the sun. Um, especially something like rosemary. These are quite hardy plants. They have, like I said, that thick, fleshy, succulent stem and leaf. So they're actually um, probably one of the easier plants to care for um, in terms of herbs. Your basil might want a little bit more sun, but you know what? The best way to go is to try. Um, so if you're getting, you know, if, if you're getting some bright indirect light, you, you should be okay. And I think just try it out. And if your plant's not happy, you can move it to a, a sunnier spot within your space. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to take one more here. Um, it is from Christina. She's asking, if you have your herbs outside in the summertime, can you then move them inside for the winter? That is an amazing question. Really, really good question. Um, and I've done that myself, especially with my rosemary. Um, that has gotten humongous. You know, you don't want to leave it outside. You don't want it to die. You want to just keep it going. My bay leaf tree. Um, so yes, absolutely, you can bring them inside. The thing that you want to ensure before bringing your plants inside, and that goes for anything. If you've got palms that are outdoors or you've got any tropical plants that are outside and you know, end of September is coming around and you want to start bringing those plants back indoors, you don't want to bring any of the bad bugs inside with you. And I don't mean bad bugs like spiders. I mean, sure, those are bad to some people, but they're not going to mess with your plants like mites will, like thrips will, like any of those bad plant killers will. So before bringing any outdoor plant inside, you really want to make sure that you're giving it a good hose down. And honestly, it can be as easy as just hosing down the leaves. You can use some insecticidal soap, which you can buy at, you know, Home Depot or most garden centers. It's essentially a concentrated formula that you dilute into water and you spray it onto your leaves. It's kind of like a light soap detergent, um, and that helps to combat any um, insects that might be on the underside of the leaf or in the stems. Um, you also want to think about the soil. I find that taking the plant out of its pot, maybe I can just show you with this guy. I find that by taking the plant out of its pot and just really actually drenching the soil will help to remove a lot of those um, insects as well. You can also use insecticidal soap on your soil um, or just repotting your plant entirely before bringing it in if you really are concerned about whether or not it's infested with, you know, those bad spider mites or anything like that. But you do want to just, you know, at the very least ensure that you're giving it a good spray down before bringing it inside. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. 
Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm just looking at the time. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm so excited. Our first ever summer market online event. I'm hoping that um, everyone's doing more of the sessions throughout the day. I know that I'm checking out Jason Blaine next. Um, so make sure that you click on your links and that you continue to enjoy these sessions. We're really trying to get you ready for summer. I want to say thank you so much to Emma. It's always a pleasure. Emma, I will tell you that while you were talking, I was getting some private messagings in the chat, just saying that everyone loves you so much. You got such a great energy. So we really appreciate you coming oh, today. So glad. Yes, and I love hearing you know, my passion for plants and people. And um, I hope that it encourages you guys at home to, you know, maybe, maybe try your, your hand at a new plant or a new herb that you haven't tried growing before. Um, I'm a huge um, disbeliever in black thumbs. I think that everyone has the ability to grow something and to grow it uh, successfully. It just requires, you know, a little bit of research and just making sure that you have the right information and um, you're, you can certainly get a lot of that information from us. Um, absolutely. So thank you for having me. Great. Okay. And so I posted Emma's information. Uh, so make sure that you're checking out her Instagram and um, she's got a Facebook page, a website, a YouTube page, or some great information on there. Um, and then this session along with all the other sessions from Summer Market today will be posted on our AC Always Connected page. Um, so look for that. Once they're ready, we'll get them posted up there. And I want to say thank you all for joining and we will see you in the next sessions. Bye. Okay, Emma, I have to jump off as well. So thank you so much. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. I hope the rest of the day goes amazing for you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.